In the 1800s, John Pierpont Morgan ruled the business world. J.P. Morgan was America's financier and industrial organizer, one of the world's foremost influential financial figures during the two pre-World War I decades. J.P. Morgan had a familial advantage that helped him to become rich and successful. He came from generations of wealth and professional achievements. Pierpont's father, Junius Spencer Morgan was much more influential in his life. He was a very successful and powerful financier. He was respected in American and European banking. John Pierpont Morgan was born on April 17, 1837. He was a weak child, had convulsions as a baby, and often had rheumatic fever, scarlet fever, and other illnesses. J.P.'s medical issues forced him to stay at home. He couldn't play outside like the other kids. He was mostly staying indoors, and started studying financial statements from an early age. He enjoyed playing solitaire, and that became his lifelong hobby. J.P. was a natural leader. His interest in charismatic leaders inspired a school essay on Napoleon Bonaparte. Despite his parents' efforts to introduce him to American heroes, Pierpont was only moved by Napoleon's desire for world dominance. Junius, J.P.'s father joined George Peabody and Company on October 1, 1854, and the family moved to London. His father Junius ensured J.P. had the best education and career opportunities. Junius sent J.P., then 17, to Institute Sillig, a 600-mile-away Swiss boarding school on Lake Geneva, to instill responsibility and discipline. J.P. went to Wall Street after college to profit from the expanding American market. His Wall Street job gave him invaluable business experience. He began his career in 1857 as an accountant with the New York banking firm of Duncan Sherman & Company, which was the American representative of the London firm G. E. George Peabody & Company. His overseas intelligence work included sending his father in London the latest American economic and political updates. His drive outgrew that small business, so he started his own. Banking allowed Pierpont to socialize with New York's elites. At one of these gatherings, J.P. met Amelia Sturges who was from the banking family. J.P. and Amelia spent three years together before they got engaged to be married. Everything was going well. But Amelia became sick right before their marriage. Besides her concerns, they got married but her health was not getting better. J.P. took Amelia to the best of the doctors, but Morgan's worst fear was confirmed. Tuberculosis was always fatal back then. Money couldn't change her path, sadly. Amelia Morgan died on February 17, four months after their wedding. J.P. returned to New York and threw himself into his work to cope with loss. He spent two years building his image as a reliable American banker, which required long days and discipline. The Civil War began around this time. As per the new law he had to fight in the war. But Morgan paid $300 to avoid serving and have a substitute fight. JP didn't sit idly by while wars raged. Morgan profited from the ongoing bloodshed. He knew bond prices fluctuated with war news. Predicting the outcome of a Union Confederate battle was lucrative. Morgan found ways to profit from the war beyond Union bond speculation. The Hall Carbine affair began when a New Yorker named Hall contacted 24-year-old Pierpont with an unusual business proposal. JP and Mr. Simon Stevens, an attorney got into a deal, where Steven got 20,000 at 7% interest, to buy some 5,000 antique rifles called Hall Carbines. The weapons were functional despite their age, and Stevens could purchase them from the Union Army for the ridiculously low price of $3.50 apiece. With J.P.'s money, Stevens planned to modernize the weapons cartridges, doing so would extend their accuracy and effectiveness. Stevens spent only 75 cents more on each gun to upgrade the arsenal's quality. The plan worked perfectly. After the Union Army was defeated at the First Battle of Bull Run, the demand for firearms soared. The military paid the steep price tag to restock on the upgraded weapons. The same guns that retail for $3.50 each cost them $22 in just a few weeks. J.P.'s father, 
who believed in being cautious and not gambling with the family business, was not pleased by these deals. During this time JP married Frances Louisa Tracy and started their family. After the Civil War, the United States experienced a multi-decade economic boom that came to be known as the Gilded Age or the Age of Enterprise. Between the years 1870 and 1910, both the United States population and its per-person income more than doubled so did its need for money. J.P. Morgan's prime location on Wall Street was backed by the same old-school investment funds that Pierpont Sr. was using in London. Junius had invested too much time and energy into establishing connections between the United States and London for his son. To help JP out, Junius Morgan formed a new business alliance with one of his old associates, who had deep ties with the British capital. Junius chose Anthony Drexel, who was 11 years older than JP, to be his mentor. American operations run by Drexel were already generating annual profits of $350,000. JP and Drexel founded a company with $5 million seed money from Junius. In 1871, Drexel Morgan & Company was established as an independent firm, and largely through Morgan's ability, it became one of the most powerful banking houses in the world. In the late 19th century, railroads were a lucrative industry. He began reorganizing railroads in 1885 to achieve greater efficiency. He arranged an agreement between the New York Central Railroad and the Pennsylvania Railroad, two of the largest railroads in the country that mitigated a destructive rate war and rail line competition between them. Morgan used to own stock in these railroad companies and take an active role in the corporate management of the rails he invested in. Investing in a company and joining the board of directors would give Morgan the power to influence the company's management and steer it in the direction he saw fit. It was said that JP, despite serving as a director on many boards, was in fact the board's de facto chairman at all times. Since there were no government agencies to oversee things, he was simply known as the sheriff in the wild west of the rail industry. Morgan became a master of the consolidation process, increasing his firm's revenue by brokering more massive deals, as word of his success spread. Junius died in 1890, leaving Pierpont a $15 million inheritance along with his father's role in the banking empire which doubled Morgan's fortune overnight. Soon after, Drexel died in 1893, leaving the banking firm in Morgan's hands. The company was reorganized as J.P. Morgan & Company in 1895. This company soon became the predominant source of U.S. government financing. Morgan's strongest business skill was turning failing companies into profitable ones. Following the U.S. financial panic of 1893, J.P. Morgan helped the railroad industry to recover by merging railroad companies that enabled him to amass a great fortune. Post-depression in 1893, Morgan organized a group that supplied the depleted U.S. government gold reserve with $62 million in order to avert a treasury crisis. Three years later, he started funding a series of massive industrial consolidations that would change the American manufacturing sector. He arranged the merger of Edison General Electric and Thomson Houston Electric Company to become General Electric, which became the dominant electrical equipment manufacturing firm in the United States. After helping to fund the establishment of the Federal Steel Company in 1898, Morgan participated in its merger with the Carnegie Steel Company and other steel firms in 1901 to form United States Steel Corporation. This was the first corporation in history to reach a market capitalization of $1 billion. Morgan formed the International Harvester Company IHC, in 1902 by bringing together several established producers of agricultural machinery. In the same year, he also formed the International Mercantile Marine IMM, a merger of the majority of transatlantic shipping lines T, had included White Star but ultimately met with less success. Morgan and his banking firm had major control over some of the nation's leading corporations and financial institutions. He remained the dominant figure in American capitalism until his death in 1913. His estimated fortune was at $80 million at the time of his death, 
which is equivalent to $2.2 billion in 2021. It was remarkable. Hope you enjoyed this video. See you soon in the next one.